Hi, everyone. It uh, is 6.30 and looks like we've got a quorum, so I'd like to get started on time. Uh, nice to see everyone here. Um, just the focus of the meeting tonight, um, we're going to review uh, our budgets, RAVEN, RTCC, and the OSSD budget in general. We will have uh, questions and um, a presentation by Lane around the budget and for questions. Uh, we also will hear about our strategic planning process. And um, really, we don't have too much more going on, which um, might mean for a short, might make, make a short meeting. Um, we'll also be uh, talking about uh, tuitions, um, announced tuitions, and we will, instead of having policy governance training after the executive session, we will be sort of reviewing open meeting laws and um, executive session use and things like that. So uh, first I'd like to assign a meeting evaluator. Uh, as one of the board members ha uh, have not done it recently, I would love to um, have you do it. Any volunteers? I can do it. It's Meg. Thanks, Meg. That would be great. Um, Linda, the I believe the evaluation sheet was attached to our agenda. Is that correct? Okay, Meg, you can find that um, as part of the agenda packet. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to open it up for any public comment or question. Is there anyone um, public here who would like to start the meeting off with a question or comment? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll get started. Um, first, we've got um, the strategic plan update, though I do not know if Ann Kaplan's on here yet. Um, I do not see her name. Ann Kaplan, are you here? All right, so let's let's uh, hear from Ann after this then. Um, next, we have the Raven and RTCC budgets. You wanna start with those, Lane? Yeah, I'll throw the, the presentation up in just a moment. Um, Ann should be here. She was emailing me. There she is. Just a little while ago, back and forth. Um, so she just, she literally just logged in. Ann Kaplan, it, um, do you, are you ready to give us a brief update about the strategic planning process? Yes, I am. Sorry right. about that. I was just finishing up my dinner. Lost track of the time. Um, so uh, we are going to be starting up on January 18th. Um, and I did have one question for the board. So um, in looking at, at the folks that um, were on the, uh, not on the list, but the, the criteria or the people that um, Winton wanted to have in the group, the design team, he had indicated somebody from the tech center, but in thinking about that a little bit more, I was thinking because the tech center is sort of separate from the three elementary and the middle and the high school, and they have their own advisory board, um, and and they have students from other schools. I'm I would I wanted to just make sure that I was clear with Winton that we're we as a board want to sort of focus on the five schools that make up the Orange Southwest School District because even we send over students to the tech center. So I just want to make sure that was what we were thinking because we don't have anybody sort of representing or, or you know, with sort of that point of view on the, on the, on the design team. So I'm just curious. I thought uh, Jeremy Layford was on the design team. No. No? Okay. I also did speak to Lane about it, and he was sort of uh, agreeing with me that um, 
that that perhaps we should focus on those the five OSUD schools. So yeah, I just I, wanted to make sure that was whether or not the board was in agreement with that. Yeah, and part of the thought process when Ann, Ann brought up a good question, um, they're kind of they're a separate ent entity. Their goals and their needs are somewhat, in, in a lot of ways, strikingly different than. Um, what the Orange Southwest School District um, uh, is. Um, and so while I think you guys are geared up really well for OSSD, if you want to um, incorporate the tech center, it might need to be a separate process just because of given how um, discrete these entities are from one another. But again, we, we, we had talked and um, said that it was a, a decision the board should probably make if they want to try to do it all together or try to do two separate processes or just focus on the OSSD. <clears throat> it seems to me smart to focus on the OSSD. I mean, we've got um, other schools involved. Um, you know, that really it's supposed to be in, in, in board membership for the uh, RTCC center. So really, um, you know, the White River Valley School District and the Northfield School District, et cetera, should be overseeing in part RTCC. So it doesn't really seem appropriate to be creating um, a strategic plan that would also incorporate the tech center, in my mind. Are there any other concerns um, and for the design team that we should be thinking about? Um, no, that was the, the only one that came up. We, we also, we have, um, we don't have a teacher from the, from the middle school or high school, but the way the process is gonna work, we're gonna be gathering feedback from the staff at the middle and high school. So I, I think we're okay there. Um, when I asked Lane again about that, he indicated that Elijah had said staff were kind of feeling tapped out at this point. So um, I think that'll I think that'll work out okay. Um, and we'll we'll be getting started with the design team on January 18th. Any, and so, so and we'll you see. heard you heard from all the members, and and everyone will be there. I'm assuming so. I haven't heard back from everyone, but I didn't tell them to email me back. So, um, and Winton's going to be sending out sort of the whole sort of explanation of what this is all going to look like. Um, he's re done it so that it's starting on January 18th and then it goes through the whole process from that point and I think we finish up in May or June with sort of the board you know finalizing and, and voting on the final plan. Great so um, I saw that sort of an accelerated timeline it looks like you'll have two or three meetings before our next board meeting so next our next board meeting you'll have plenty to tell us about and um, mm -hmm. yeah great sounds good thank you yep all right next uh lane uh we have uh, a presentation of the raven and rtcc budgets and uh just a, a couple of caveats before i get get rolling here um if I'm looking off to the side, I got a second computer up and running um, because what happens is that if I'm presenting, I can't see anybody. Um, and we have people that'll log in a little bit late and I'd like to be able to let them in so that they, they, they know that they can get into the meeting. So I'm gonna apologize for that ahead of time. Um, other thing to know is that we actually got <laughs> a lot of the final numbers um, that we needed to do tonight's presentation to give you a finalized budget. Um, for uh, your approval tonight uh, around noon. Um, so we were scrambling around right up till 5 p.m. tonight um, to revamp and revise um, everything. Um, you're gonna see that the, the Raven um, recommendation has not changed, Tech Center recommendation has changed, and then there are major changes um, 
to the OSSD budget, right? Because you vote on three separate budgets. Um, as part of the process tonight, and, and Laura, you can help me a little bit with this. Uh, based upon the agenda, um, it looks like we should probably be voting on each budget as we hit them in the presentation. Is that what you would like to do or would you like me to go through the whole presentation first? I guess it makes sense to just vote on each budget as they're presented, if that's okay with you. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I just, I wanna make it comfortable and I wanna make sure that people get, get a chance to kind of answer questions as they need to. Um, so give me a second here to get, get things set up in the present view. Uh, window. That one. And just so everyone knows, we will, um, after each presentation, there will be a time for board members to ask questions. And then if anyone uh, else, any public uh, would like to make it, have a question or comment for Lane about a certain budget, uh, feel free to do so as well. I'm going to apologize. I got to log out, log back in. Google just froze on me. Be right back. All right, let's try this again. All right, can you guys see the presentation and gals? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. And I'm assuming I've got my microphone on and you can hear me. <laughs> uh, so there are three separate budgets, um, and we kind of talked about this last time that you'll be looking at tonight. There's the, the Raven budget, there's the RTCC, the Technical Center budget, and then there's the, the big one, which is the overall uh, district budget um, that encompasses our elementary schools and our, our middle high school. Um, the Raven budget from the last time that we spoke about this in uh, December, um, remains unchanged. Um, if you look at uh, our current year, 2020-2021, uh, versus um, what we're proposing for next year, the actual cost of running the program has gone down, but the number of students that, that we serve has gone down. It's typically around 14. Um, it's down around 11 right now. Um, and so what that has done is the cost of the program has gone down, uh, but because this is a tuition-based program, right, it's all funded by the tuitions that we bring in, um, the tuition has gone up. Uh, it's gone up about $2,000. Now, a couple of things about this. That seems like a lot of money. Um, recognize that the students that we are serving through Raven uh, next year for $26,693 a, a student, um, if they had went to anywhere else in the state to get the same services, the tuition alone would be 60,000 and that wouldn't include their transportation. Um, so it is still a tremendous deal. Uh, the other thing that needs to be said about this is that um, while we set the tuition at 26,693, if we get more students and we expect we'll be back up around 14 next year, right? Enrollments are down a little bit because people are nervous about COVID. Um, we can always uh, reduce the tuition. We can't bring it up um, after we've announced it, um, but, but we can bring it down. And in the case of Raven, just like the technical center, um, if we've uh, overcharged, uh, we have to give all but 3% of that, that money back anyway um, at the end of the year. Um, so this is the Raven budget. Um, I can hear you even though I can't see you. Um, are there, there questions? Lane, this is Ashley. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. How many students do we have in Raven this year? Can you remind me? Uh, about 11. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other thing that happened too, if um, people remember that goes into a little bit of the cost reduction is we changed buildings. Um, we had the, the very old building that was out beyond the technical center. 
Um, we actually transferred them into a new building here by central office. And so there's been some efficiencies uh, because of that. And these are, um, these are students that typically would be in, a, in an outplace program. Um, Raven for especially the newer board members uh, is a collaborative. Um, we run it here through the OSSD. So uh, there are students that come in from um, the same sending schools that we receive students for from the tech center. Um, it's a self-contained program. Um, a lot of the students do uh, get the skills and the independence necessary to eventually join uh, the technical center. Um, when I was doing a cost analysis last year, um, we typically on average send between two and three of our own students to Raven each year. Um, if we were having to pay for outside services at another location, um, that would cost the district about an additional million dollars uh, every seven to nine years. Um, so it is, is saving the district quite a bit of money by having this program here. So all, all the stuff. So Lane, one quick question, it's Brian. Um, the staffing and programs, everything is per, just pretty much similar to you had last year. It's just the, the difference is just because of the number of uh, students. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it's typically around 14. Um, now it's down uh, around 11. Uh, we had been trying to plan on having two full-time teachers there um, in the hopes of actually expanding the program. Um, the one problem that we've got is the current space that we're in is a little bit smaller than the old building, but we do have plans if we ever get the opportunity um, to uh, expand the program with more students is we can blow out the north wall and expand uh, to the building to the north um, to bring in. So one of the other changes, you know, we were trying to get a second teacher. We've never been able to do that. We can't find one um, that's either qualified or, or willing to do that position. Um, so we've been running it as we always have with a teacher and with a, um, a paraprofessional. So good question. Are there further details on this program that you want to give us besides the announced tuition? Um, this is pretty much it. So you've got the total cost of the program for next year at 266,930. Yep. Um, and that total cost of that program is down is down 73,000 from the previous year. And, and what is that re reduction um, due to if you're if you're sticking with the same staff? I mean, uh, so the cost of the program is down um, because of the changeover and then like I, like I said I intimated um, we had always been planning on two teachers there um, we weren't able to get it so we've reduced that to a paraprofessional okay. the tuition is up however just because of the reduction in the number of students so I'm glad you guys are asking me clarifying questions I've been, been like I said scrambling around right up to the last minute when the, the last data came in around noon are there any other questions for Lane about this budget from public or board? Are we ready for a vote? I make a motion that we accept the Raven budget as presented by Lane. I second. Um, would you like to do a roll call vote on these, seeing as it's so hard to see one another? Or um, I, that's, that's I guess, my proposal, if that's OK with everyone. Um, all right, so hopefully I don't forget anyone. So Ann Kaplan? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. Brian? Aye. Meg? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And uh, myself, I'm in favor as well. So it's unanimous. I didn't skip anyone, right? OK, next lane, RTCC. So. Um we had talked about this in December, so it has changed uh, markedly. 
Um, one of the issues that we had uh, was uh, this pre-tech program um, that was uh, in its fledgling year last year, kind of trying to get it up and running, um, that came out of a mandate from the state to try to get younger students in, involved um, in, in experiencing what a technical center program um, might look like. Um, we weren't able to generate uh, any funding despite the fact that we were paying for an instructor for that program last year. Um, talking uh, in detail with Felicia this year, um, she is confident and has the program set up um, and has worked with the state to make sure that we will have tuition dollars rolling in for sponsoring this program. I mean, it's a good idea either way, just because it's 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 drumming up um, more business in, in a sense, um, because the students are getting a chance to kind of uh, experience ahead of time what they potentially um, may be able to take uh, part of, you know, as as they get a little bit older. Um, but it would be nice to have this program um, generate some money. Um, so in the original budget that I showed you. Uh, I had uh, left uh, that instructor in there um, with the assumption that, you know, there's no tuition dollars that are rolling in. And that had pushed the tuition up over 18,000, which was kind of a, a critical threshold that last year um, the board rightfully kind of pushed back on. Um, so what we did is uh, the RTCC um, has reserve funds. Um, that it has, it actually has, let's get my number here, uh, $515,000 worth of reserve funds um, that is saved up over, over years. Um, and so what we've done in this budget that I'm proposing for you tonight is that for one year is that we pay for that instructor um, out of the reserve funds, um, which will bring um, the total amount of the, the, the budget down, right? Because it's money that we already have that we don't have to get from somewhere else and we'll bring the tuition down as well. And pay for that position out of the reserve fund for a year, um, do everything we can to make it viable. And if we get students rolling in and tuition rolling in from it, then next year we will move it into um, the regular budget. Um, so under this process, under this model that we've put together, um, the actual uh, cost of the overall budget uh, for RTCC has gone down by about $27,000. Um, the impact in terms of tuition um, is it'll actually be $99 per student cheaper than it was last year. And then kind of looking historically at what tuitions have been uh, for the Tech Center for the last uh, about 10 years, um, this would be the lowest tuition that uh, technical center students in districts have paid since 2018 and 19. Um, one of the things for uh, the folks that are new to the board um, to recognize is that it, it takes uh, three full years uh, for the full impact of additional students to show up in terms of increased funding from the state for these programs. Um, and so, you know, it take, takes a year or two, you know, we, we do get additional funding for the state for the enrollment, but there's a bit of a lag time before we get the full impact of it. And so it would be nice to kind of carry this program for a year, um, get us to year two, where, um, you know, if we've got some good numbers in there, uh, the, the money that we get from the state to help us support the program um, will go up to a point that we should be able to switch it over to the regular budget without having a dramatic impact on the tuition. Um, so I'll stop there for a, a couple of uh, minutes for, for folks to ask questions. So Lane, it's Ashley, and I have questions. Um, for yeah. the, the teacher, for the pre-tech program, has that teacher, do we already have that teacher on staff? So they're currently being funded through RTCC? Yeah, this is uh, Jason um, brought the position in. Um, a lot of pressure for him to work with the state to get tuition up and running. Uh, fell apart, I think, a little bit during the transition. Um, Felicia has picked up that ball um, and hopefully by second semester, we're planning on, on, on trying to run this with some students and get some tuition money rolling in. Okay, and I just have one more. Thank you. Um, yeah. As far as the uh, census for that program, what's the goal? So the technical center programs are kind of limited by, by, by state reg to 
14, 15 students. Um, what we've been finding is depending upon the cost of the instructor, uh, the break even point is somewhere um, between four and six students. Um, so the goal at least is to break even, um, but obviously we'd love to have it up um, around uh, the 14 to 15 um, if we're using a model where they're coming, coming in uh, to us. Um, Jason had an interesting model that was set up last year where um, the instructor was actually going out um, to the other schools. Thank you. Lane, has there been interest on the part of the sending schools to um, get their students involved in this? Oh yeah, they were um, they were quite involved um, last year. I mean, they were going out to Williamstown and Northfield as well as serving some of our students here. Um, so I, I have very high hopes that she's gonna be able to fill this right up. Um, the other place where um, what we've done in the past, which might play into this program, um, is we have some of our own younger students at the elementary um, school um, who struggle a little bit in a regular academic environment. But as a, as a reward, um, what we've done is, hey, you know, if you can successfully complete this, this, and this in terms of the regular academic environment, you know, one day a week we'll, we'll send you over and you can participate in the, the technical center programs. And that's been very, very, very positive and it has a dramatic impact on these students' uh, the lives, the ones that have participated. And so that's something that we're hoping to be able to expand a bit um, as this gets up and going. Do you still hope to, or does Felicia still hope to run this in the second semester this year? That's my understanding, yes, at our last conversation. And I give her a lot of credit. She's been very, very aggressive about getting things done, um, which has been which has been awesome. And then remember uh, as well that she is, uh, you know, the dental program. Um, we've got the new electrical program that is, is up and running this year. And we were discussing as well about the possibility of a plumbing program. Lane, well, because we're pulling money from our reserve fund, um, many of our reserve funds are, are dedicated. Um, are you, have you cleared through with Robin that we've got access to that? And is that gonna mean that voters need to do an additional uh, approval of, a, of an allocation of reserve funding or, or not? So uh, we checked on this with the legal eagles um, a few months back. We had actually notified the board that we would that we actually had a reserve fund and that we were going to be using some of the money for some facilities upgrades. Um, the wording that we got at that point in time with uh, reserve funds, as far as they go along with um, a technical center, is my job is just to notify the board what we're doing and make sure that you're in the loop. So if you approve this budget um, tonight. Um, you're definitely in the loop and you're actually approving the use of those funds. So this does not go through, uh, is, is our understanding, this does not go through the, the typical surplus to reserve fund kind of vote that happens with the OSSD budget. You must have checked with Pietro about this, that there are no legal implications because really this is a collaborative uh, center, correct? Yeah. And uh, you guys are the board that controls and oversees that center and has final say. Um, so your vote has the big, the big meaning here. <clears throat> are there any further questions for Lane about the RTCC proposed budget? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the budget as presented? Uh, I make a motion that we approve the RTCC budget as presented. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, um, we're ready for a vote. Um, Anne? Aye. Uh, Ashley? Aye. 
Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. Brian? Aye. Meg? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And myself, I'm also in favor. All right, so the budget is approved eight to zero. Thank you. Lastly, um, the OSSD budget, which we understand has been changed substantially. Yeah, and um, so we'll, I'll talk about this one for, for a bit. Um, you know, the, the board members that were here in previous years, uh, we were do doing so much structure building um, to improve uh, student achievement that there were lots of details on each budget as we were um, looking at new staff uh, and new programs. Um, so these budgets so far, you know, have been fairly simple because we're kind of getting to that level, level service um, uh, budget phase. Um, this one um, has some details to it because to make it work, um, we are trying to use some surplus money to subsidize given the economic crisis that's out there. And I'll explain all those details as we go through. Um, but it's critical in terms of the board members, um, if there are questions as I'm on a slide, please interrupt me, um, ask the questions um, so that I can explain it um, and so that it's clear. Because what we're talking about also has to be clear um, with the public. Um, to make sure that they understand, you know, what their votes mean, because it's a little different than than, than previous years. Um, and you guys are disembodied voices to me. Like I said, I can't see you, so don't be afraid to just speak up and interrupt. Um, doesn't bo bother me in the least, and it's going to be critical to making sure that folks understand. So again, we had kind of talked a little bit about this at the the last meeting. Is that you know our goals um, as we're kind of progressing through the years here is moving towards a level service budget. Um, the towns have been awesome um, the last couple of years. You know, we talked about the needs in terms of improving student academics and achievement, um, of making sure that we've got a strong focus on improving independence in terms of our special education students, um, and talked an awful lot in previous years about the structures that would get us there. Um, obviously, those structures cost money, and the, the towns um, came to our aid in a big way and provided us uh, with the funding that we needed to get those structures in place um, that are now up and running. And so now that we've got 99.9% .9 of what we need um, to achieve our goals, we're in this phase of, of moving towards a, a level service budget. And that means um, only doing increases from year to year that are required to maintain our current operations. You know, we're not building anything new, we're not asking for anything new, um, but each year the cost of things um, does go up a little bit. And so just paying for those additional costs to keep doing what we're doing. Um, also remember, I think it's hard for anyone to forget uh, that we're still in the middle of this ongoing um, pandemic. And so, you know, one of the goals for this budget year is making sure that we still got what we need um, to enhance student and staff safety. And then it's just, it's that continued push, um, pushing forward on the, the district strategic ends plan. Um, you know, improving uh, student achievement in uh, ELA and math, getting a K to 12 science curriculum in place and up and running and getting the students to achieve at least on par with uh, the Vermont uh, state average. And then again, real concentrated focus on our special education students, making sure that they get the skills that they need um, so that they can become independent and can move off their plans. All right, so here comes the big explanation um, in terms of what we're trying to do. And what's always been kind of cool about coming to Vermont from Massachusetts um, is people in Vermont really kind of, for the most part, understand the tax structures. Um, but just to make sure, because we've got new board members, I want to kind of talk through this in a very general um, level um, so that folks really kind of understand what it is we're attempting to do. Um, with this budget in terms of a strategy. So it's really important that you think of a school budget like a fixed cost, right? You know, you can think of it like your car insurance. It's pretty much the same amount um, each year. It might go up a little bit, um, but it's something that you know you got to pay. And um, every year uh, you have to put money aside to be able to pay that. Um, the problem with fixed cost is, is that if the income that's paying for that fixed cost goes down, right, the money you've got coming in uh, to be able to pay for it um, goes down or is eliminated, 
then to be able to pay for that fixed cost, you've got to find the money from somewhere else to pay for it. Now, in our case, uh, in the bigger picture of, of taxes and, and school funding, the tax income that's been flowing into the education fund is predicted to be down this year. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, because a lot of the money that supports education comes from things like restaurants and, and hotels, all the things that are impacted uh, pretty hard uh, by the COVID uh, pandemic. So if this huge uh, amount of income that's flowing in that supports the schools, if it goes down, and if the cost of schools is staying pretty much about the same, you know, not going up, but staying about the same, the state's put into this position where they've got to adjust the tax formulas to make up the difference. So the bottom line is, is that the local tax burdens um, are going to increase even if our fixed costs do not. And that's due to the impact um, of uh, the pandemic. So as part of uh, policy governance and as part of just what, what good managers do anyway, is that when we're planning budgets, uh, is we're trying to look out a few years um, as we're doing the planning now, um, in case we can do things now that can support future years. Um, and by the looks of things, it's probably going to take two or three years uh, for the tax incomes, uh, the, the tax revenues generated by the state to return to normal. Um, and so it's reasonable and fair that during this period of time, the district should seek to help out the community members that have supported us so well um, by reducing tax burdens, right? You guys have, have, have stepped up to the plate when we needed you to build um, these structures to help kids. And now we're in the middle of this economic crisis and it's our job to do what we can to reduce the tax burden on the towns. Now, that goal, um, that effort is, is a little bit in conflict with everything that we've done over the last couple of years. We, we've built some incredible structures um, that are gonna have a dramatic impact already are, and we don't wanna lose them. So we need a solution for this. And um, to be able to make sure that people understand what the solution is, I've gotta talk in general about what a surplus is and what reserve funds are, and then I can apply it to what I'm proposing um, for next year's budget. So the big blue box there is our budget. That's the amount of money um, that we go out. We ask uh, the, the, the towns to supply us with. Um, they vote on that budget. The money rolls in. Um, we use it over the course of a, a fiscal year uh, to meet all our financial needs. And then typically at the end of the year, we have money that is left over. That money is called our surplus. Um, in most cases, for us, we tend to have fairly good sur surpluses from 200 to 300,000 is the norm. Um, a lot of that comes from things like uh, a veteran teacher retiring, and then we hire in somebody new because remember, we plan these budgets nine months um, in advance of the year that we're going to use them in. And so we plan it based upon current staff. So if current staff leaves and we hire someone new, if there's a change in salaries, and there often is, um, that can result in a surplus. Um, there are also uh, costs that we have to pay um, that we get reimbursed for. But the problem is we have to have the money in the budget up front to pay the costs to meet our, our financial obligations. And then we're re reimbursed after the fact and those end up um, as part of the surplus. So we have surplus money and it's left over. And if we do nothing about that surplus money at the end of the fiscal year, it goes back to the state. Well, in most cases, that's not what's most beneficial to districts. So most districts like us set up what are called reserve funds. Reserve funds are accounts that we put surplus money into. And as Ann was saying a little bit earlier, that have to be used for specific purposes. And right now we have four. We have a facilities reserve fund, a transportation reserve fund, a special education reserve fund, and a legal um, reserve fund. So like the facilities reserve fund, on the warrant that goes out, when people go out to vote, you know, they will see typically a, a line on there to vote for, you know, do you approve taking a million dollars of the surplus and putting it into the facilities reserve fund? And in every year that I've been here, the, the communities have been wonderful about doing that. So 
Why is this beneficial to us in these cases? Well, if I've got a million or two sitting in the facilities reserve fund, when something big comes along that we need to pay for, like replacing the roof on um, Randolph Elementary and replacing the roof on Randolph Union High School, both, both which have happened while I've been here, we can pull the money from the reserve funds because the towns have pre-approved it for use on facilities. And I don't have to go out to the town asking for more money to do this big work. I don't have to go out to bond. So it's it's really kind of a win-win um, in a lot of ways. So surplus funds are what's left over at the end of the year. Um, if the town votes on those sur for surplus funds, we can move those surplus funds into reserve funds that we can use later um, to support our operations, usually for big ticket items. So I'll stop for a second and make sure that folks are, are, are understanding this. And if there's any questions before I move into the solution. Hearing none, I shall move to the next step. Um, the solution that we are proposing is that we take those surplus monies um, at the from the end of the 2019-2020 school year, um, and we use them to subsidize the tax burden um, on our three towns until the state's revenues recover. Right? So we have this huge surplus, which we'll talk about in the next slide because we worked our tails off to get it in anticipation that this is what we'd have to do um, to try to help the help the, the community members in the towns out. Um, and now what we're going to need to do if uh, this budget I'm proposing is going to work is on March 3rd is get the town's um, people to vote that surplus into a new fund, what we're going to call an operational reserve fund. And what that fund will be used to do is we will draw money out of it to cover some of the costs of the budget so that we don't have to ask for as much from the towns. We really, um, you know, March, April last year, it was really apparent um, to most of us that this was going to be a difficult fiscal year in terms of budgeting um, because of the coronavirus. It was clear that this was a long term problem that, you know, coronavirus wasn't going away anytime soon. And so in anticipation of that, we pulled out all stops at the end of last year to create the largest surplus we could. Um, we froze spending for things that weren't unnecessary. Um, we had a lot of programs that couldn't run because of, of uh, coronavirus, so therefore we had savings there. And then we worked our tails off. I should say, you know, Robin and a lot of credit uh, um, to the payroll folks work their tails off to get every penny in reimbursement that we could from the coronavirus relief fund. And so we are sitting right now on $1.6 million of surplus because of those efforts. What we would like to do is just what you see in the picture, right? The big black box, that's what everybody's got to pay. Um, if we do this without subsidizing uh, the tax burden this year by using some of the surplus. If we use this surplus money, if we put it into the operational reserve fund, if the taxpayers vote to do that, what we can do is ask for less money in terms of the, the, the budget um, and then subsidize the remainder of what we need from those operational reserves with the impact being that what we are asking for from the community in terms of taxes is much reduced. So questions before I go into the, the numbers. Does this process make sense? Wayne, I, I, just, I just have one question and that is, any inkling at all whether the state is going to say to all these districts that might have extra that you can't do something like this? I, I just wonder. They, they've been they've been chomping at the bit. Um, and so uh, it's an awesome question. I wish you could see your face right now. Um, they've been chomping at the bit for two or three years. Um, 
and there's been discussions that keep coming up about, well, you know, the districts have surplus money. You know, how come we can't take that back to fill in some of the gaps in our other budgets? Um, they could p pass legislation. In talking um, with Pietro about it, it would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, but they keep eyeing it. Um, we do have a significant amount of money already in surplus funds um, that is above what our needs are for anything in the foreseeable future. And when I look at that, and I look at everything that we could be using that for on behalf of kids, um, you know, I've got this, this goal of really pumping that money back into the district any way that I can to serve students. Um, it's there, it's available. We've done a tremendous amount of facilities work and, and upgrades um, to keep things up and running and, and, and program work. Um, but um, we don't wanna do away with the, those reserve funds, but we wanna get them down to a level that's gonna support our foreseeable needs and at the same time, not be a temptation for, uh, for legislators. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we've been discussing in the, in the district uh, over the last year amongst the cabinet and with Robin. Um, so, so very good question. We did run this uh, by uh, Pietro, by the legal team, and it is perfectly okay to do um, what we're proposing. So good question. Other questions before I move on to the numbers? Okay. Are you I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just wondered if you're taking public questions. I can wait, Laura, until after you're done. I'm okay, we are taking public questions, but um, yeah, my question is, so what happens after a, a couple of years of subsidizing um, our local budget? Is the budget then going to be up, you know, is the leap going to be so big um, that it's really, you know, it's going to be voted down by our towns? Just they forget that we've been subsidizing it, but with surplus, and are we going to have trouble passing the budget after that? Just... Even yeah. if it's almost a level funded budget, I worry that there's still going to be such a huge, you know, unsubsidized jump. So um, it's a very, it's a very good question. And I'm going to say um, it's possible, but it doesn't have to happen. And I'll, I'll try to explain why um, in, in a way that, that makes sense. Um, remember that the reason, our, our budget really isn't going up when you see the numbers um, from last year to this year after we kind of changed some stuff around. Um, the reason that there's a bigger tax burden on people is because they're having to make up the difference uh, between what the state couldn't raise through its regular revenue sources. Assuming that over the course of the next couple of years, we begin to recover from COVID that the economy starts to roar back to life, their coffers will start to fill up. And so we as towns won't need to subsidize their shortfalls, right? So as the money starts flowing in from them, um, assuming that COVID starts to go away, the economy starts to pick up, they start to get their tax revenues again. Um, that should make up the majority of the difference. Now, the way that I'm proposing this subsidy is that we've got one, 1. 1.6 million um, going in. This is the worst year. So the way that this proposal works is that this year we subsidize half of that. So 800,000 would be to subsidize um, this current budget. The remaining 800,000 gets split in half and used over the next two years that follow so that we slowly wean ourselves back up um, along during the time that hopefully um, the state revenues are increasing as well so that at the end of three years we're back uh, kind of to normal. Um, will it happen? Can't guarantee it, but it should or it should be darn close when we get there. Um, the other possibility is this, is we have subsidies almost every year we just continue this process every year. Um, you know, that's been one of the concerns and one of the comments from the community is, geez, why do you have that $300,000 surplus? And what we would do with the surplus is if we just keep this rolling forever, um, is that, uh, you know, we take out the little bit that we need each year to go into those other reserve funds to make sure that we can replace the roof the next time that it's due, that sort of thing. Um, and then the rest of it, goes back in to subsidize the next year's uh, taxes. 
right? So taxpayers, it's the taxpayers that put that money in there. It's, it makes sense that they should get um, some of the benefit from it if we can provide that. Um, did that make a little bit of sense, the logic? Yes, you know, uh, it's a, you know, it makes sense, uh, hopefully, that that's, that, you know, comes to pass the way that you hope. Yeah, the, the reality is this, um, in the end, it's going to be the same amount of money that people are paying. The question is, is do they pay a moderate amount for three years, or do they potentially have a cliff year where they might have a big leap? Um, that's the question that you're asking, and it's a good question. Right, and it makes sense to use this money we've saved right now, so that makes sense to me as so. well. Yeah. yeah. And again, this is my my proposal. You guys are the voting body on this. You can reject it. Tell me to go back to the drawing board. We just have to have something in place, um, you know, within the next week or so. So I'm other sorry, questions? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, but should Chris, Chris, do you want to go first before I speak? No, that's fine. I, um, you know me, I got quite a few questions. So I'll wait so that Lane can hit them one at a time. So if you want to go first, that, okay. that's fine. Thanks. So Lane, I have a two part question. The first one is maybe very similar to what Anne asked, but is there, are there any ramifications um, when this money is a surplus and any sort of grant funding or any sort of pull down funds that are available either at the state or national level, would there be any impact on this or is, is this just like a budget neutral decision? This is just a, a budget decision. In terms of our grants, um, like title grants and things like that, uh, those are dependent upon um, the level of poverty that we have across the district and our student counts, and as well as the fact that the state needs to be getting in its, uh, its, um, its state assessment data to the federal government on time each year. Um, those are those are what that's determined on. Um, so this this would have no impact on that. Okay, thank you. And I have one other question. Um, you mentioned this. This is a, um, to, in my opinion, a surprising surplus. It's a lot of money. Um, so I mean, kudos. That's fiscally responsible. But when we talk about the the, and I think maybe with that public in mind, we talk about the spending that was, you know, the, fro the freeze on spending and the programs that were, um, you know, put on hold or cut. Could you give me an idea of what those programs are? Uh, biggest biggest one was athletics. So again, um, I don't want to use the word cut because those programs are still here. They're just unable to run because of COVID. Um, and if, if you get a chance i know the lines you guys aren't supposed to really be looking at the line level of the budgets but the um the lines after paying for staff salaries um the biggest cost typically that a district has is transportation and there's a tremendous amount of transportation that goes along with with athletics um so that is probably the biggest um place where we recouped uh, money um, we also, like I said, we got about 400000 or more back um, already in CRF funds that are helping bloat this up. Um, and so um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. We, we figured about a million dollars. And so they were scrambling around. Part of what they were scrambling around with today is they got to work with the auditor. They got to work with the town treasurer to determine that surplus amount. And then when they came out and said it was close to one point, you know, 1.6, 1.7 million, I was like, are you guys sure? Please go back and check. Um, so yeah, there, there, there was a lot. Um, COVID had a real impact on, on programs um, and, and things last year that just couldn't run um, b because it was there. And so, you know, you, you would put the money in the budget for them you can't run them, and so that money is now available as surplus at the end of the year. <clears throat> so, good question. I think I hit it. If I didn't, let me know. Eileen, it's Chris Armstrong. Um, I just wondered, I have a couple of questions, but if you could first talk about the projected hit to the Vermont Education Fund, and I know that it, a while ago it was, it was projected that it was going to be a lot worse than it currently is, and that's because of like some federal monies and stuff that have come in. So if you could just touch on that a little bit, how, I know that that's the projected, but do you have, is there any information that it's going to change or no? So yeah, I can get, I can't give you solid numbers because they change them so frequently. I mean, we were looking, I think it, early on, it was like a 60 million. Um, and then, you know, 
they were doing prediction, you know, healthcare again is is up another 10% that we all got to plan for that sort of stuff. But it, it was very huge. We're going to talk a little bit about this um, when I get into the actual numbers of, you know, what's the potential impact on a household in one of these three towns based on this budget. Um, it's actually, it's, it's very small, but it may be nothing because what it, it looks like is the formulas that they gave us to do our calculations on for this budget were based upon their assumptions of a bigger shortfall than it looks like there really is. So it's quite possible that they're going to come back, um, you know, after we've gone through the process and say, hey, no, actually our state revenues are higher than we thought. Um, so we're able to help you out more than than we thought so you, you guys don't have to put it in as much um again doesn't help us right now because we gotta under timelines and whatnot for notifying people about what the potential budget is for next year we got to have this vote tonight but um it always happens that those formulas change um you know after we do our budget votes and right now uh the potential change because it looks like they predicted a bigger deficit than they're gonna have is positive for folks. Um, I can't give you a dollar amount, they can't give us a dollar amount, but that's been the discussion the, the last two or three days. Um, so okay. I, I think I gave you what I could. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and like, and anything that I ask, if you're gonna hit it later in the presentation, just let me know. So um, so there is a potential that, you know, things could happen, the, the Fed could come in and we could end up getting fully funded in the Vermont Education Fund. If that were to happen, would this money just stay in the op the operational reserve fund for future years? Uh, for the, I'm not sure if it actually works that way. It would be a good uh, question for Robin because think the way to kind of think about this is that when the towns are doing their vote voting on their budgets, um, they're really creating a bill that they are sending to the, the folks at the state house. Um, and they add up all those bills from all those towns. And that's what they need to take out of the education fund to fund education in the state as a whole. Well, they have no idea right now what each town is going to vote. So the formulas that they give us are their best guesstimates. After that voting is done, um, across all the towns, they know what has to come out of that education fund, and then they adjust the formulas to suit that. So the information that I am giving you and that folks are voting on are our best indications at the time, but what actually happens to your pocketbook could change. Um, I guess that's, is the partially, best. that's partially dependent on like what other districts do as well, right? So if we're fiscally responsible this year, um, yeah. but like Burlington passes a budget that's 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 at max or whatever, um, you know, the, our tax is not just going to pay for our budget. So, um, so I think that's like a, a I, I see what you're saying that it's kind of tough to, to judge yeah. it because we don't know what the other towns are going to vote. Right. So, and I got, I've got a good thing. We're going to talk about just what you said, because a certain amount of the money that we get per student comes from the state education fund, which everybody in the state pays for. You know, so we pay a little bit into it, but everybody else in the state is paying towards that amount as well. And then anything above that amount, that amount comes directly from us. And and we'll we'll show that a little bit later what those numbers are. Right. If it's above the state, the state guidance, right? Um yeah. so then second question. Do we have, is, is it public information? What is currently, what the balance is in those other reserved funds? Yeah, I'll show them to you at the end of the presentation. Okay, good. Cause I, I also wondered if we're not going to, typically the reserve funds get kind of replenished each year when the town votes to do that. So if we're going to now use our, res, our, our reserve money for operational, will those, those are obviously going to start to get depleted. Do we feel yeah. like um, we're going to, I just worry that in the future we might get to a position where we don't have the money to fix the roof or something like that. Is that something you're going to talk about later? Yeah, and I want you to make sure that you bring up the question exactly when that, those numbers come up, exactly the way that you did it. Because you know what what we're doing is, in our estimation, uh, the estimate for the roof. Uh, you know, we were estimating re replacing that roof was going to be you know two two million dollars. Um, and that was kind of the best that we could go, get with people going out and taking just a rough look at things. Um, the reality was it was closer to about, you know, 680,000, 700,000 to replace that roof. Um, so we've got plenty of um, 
plenty of funding there. Um, but we do have some, some projects that we want to work on in the next couple of years. Um, one of the things that, that we talked about and kind of got the ball rolling on a, a little bit last year was starting to have discussions about revamping um, the science wing. Um, we're also still, depending upon what happens with enrollments, um, because we are working on a middle school uh, model at the a high school is, you know, if we get to the opportunity where everything is working well and folks are comfortable having us bring the sixth grade into the the um, the RUHS is maybe, you know, we use some of that money to physically separate, you know, the middle school from the high school and, and do a little bit of an addition to add a second cafeteria, whatever we need to do to keep those kids separate. So, you know, we also have that in the back of our minds when we're looking at the, um, the reserve funds that we currently have. And we want to make sure that we're keeping enough in there that we're doing our, our, our fiscal diligence in terms of potentially, you know, what, what's, what's coming around the corner and the other plans that we'd like. We also have to, we've, we've held off. We wanted this to be last because it was appropriate, but eventually, you know, we've got damage that's happening in the central office building um, because of uh, work that needs to be done. It just, it needs to be gutted and the inside redone. Um, and that's, that's a, a bigger project. It's not horribly expensive, but it's bigger than it, it needs to be done if we're gonna preserve the, the facilities of the district. So really good questions, Chris. So it doesn't look like this this plan will deplete those funds so that we'll be in trouble three years down the road is what you're saying no this this money is completely separate from those funds again um it's it's the benefit of of the work that we all did last year at the end of last year um and the fact that like i said there were just a lot of programs that didn't run um that we didn't have to pay for um, because COVID prevented them from running, and then um, reimbursements that we got through the CRF funds. So that's that's why it was was so huge. Like I said, usually it's in the two to three hundred thousand dollar range. That kind of be that's kind of the norm. Uh, but this one, you know, we worked worked our tails off. We never expected it would be this big, though. Uh, okay, thank you. Yep. So good questions. Uh, other questions before I bump on. This is David. Um, I have a quick question. It sounds like the Corona relief funds helped contribute to this surplus, the 1.6. If uh, no further legislation is passed, does this estimate include everything expected through legislation passed that we know about so far? Or could there be more monies coming that the state allocates, say, in a couple months, another year? or There, there, there could be more money coming that the state allocates. Remember what this surplus is, it gets confusing because, you know, we plan our budgets a year in advance and then we take care of the surplus, you know, six months, nine months later. This is the surplus that was at the leftover at the end of the fiscal year that for the school district ended last July. So that budget is that budget is closed for all all um, purposes. There shouldn't be much more changing that's going on with it. Okay. So anything else that anything else that we might bring in that's above and beyond should be for next year's surplus. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so good question. Hey, Elaine, it's Brian. Um, how is this year looking as far as you know year to date as far on surplus for the but this year's budget? Um, well, we can talk about that when we hit the financials. Um, it's hard to estimate until we get to uh, usually about April or May, um, but we're not spending any more than we normally do because we also got reimbursed for our spending for this year. Um, we got like 900000 that came in this year to help us out this year with the spend, the additional spending we had to do um, on uh, COVID this year. So it's been a wash. Um, so, you know, if I had to give you an estimate, um, Brian, right now, um, we should be in our normal um, range, probably a little bit higher um, because athletics, you know, has been delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, if I had to give my, a rough guesstimate, um, I'd probably say 500,000 to 600,000 right now. Um, and again, a lot of that um, due to due to programs that, that weren't run because of COVID um, and the fact that, you know, they did eventually. I mean, it took them a long time to get around to it, um, but they did eventually uh, reimburse us for a lot of the extras that we were spending that were unplanned for. So when that that reimbursement money came in, it kind of washed out those additional expenses that were potentially putting us in the red.
All right. So let's see if I can explain this one a little bit. It's not. It's nice when there's there's not a lot on a slide. Um, what you're looking at on the left is current year budget. Um, this does not include federal grants, and of course, um, I think it should be. I think it should be illegal to have tax systems that are so complicated the normal normal populace can't figure them out. Um, because then you don't know what you're paying or what you should be supposed to pay. But um, what we've been required to do in recent years um, when we go out to vote is we're required to add into our totals um, all the federal grant monies that we get. Um, and it kind of makes sense because it's it's fair for the uh, the public to know exactly what you're spending. Um, but those federal grant monies do not come from the district or the taxpayers um, uh, here. I mean, I guess you could make the argument they get there indirectly because you pay your federal taxes. Um, but those those monies come in from the federal government from an outside source. Um, so I'm not including federal monies in this budget um, uh, description just to make things a little bit easier to see. Um, our federal uh, grant monies that we get are about 900,000 a year. And the vast majority of that is, is title funds. Um, and that's pretty constant from year to year. So in um, this current year, if you take out those, those federal grants, um, our budget, so the, the amount of money that um, came from the Ed Fund and local taxpayers um, was 19.7 million. What we're looking for as a total for next year, again, not including federal grants, is 20.2 million. And we'll talk about what's contained in that $523,000 increase um, from year to year. Um, what we did uh, in this current rendition of the budget, that 20.2 million um, that's up there, is we took out all discretionary spending except for $13,000. So when I talk about a level service budget, we're pretty much there right now. Um, you know, had it not been for that 13,000, I'll talk about what that's for, um, we, we would be a level service budget. And so you can expect in the future to be a level service budget is going to require about $523,000 um, to keep us um, providing the same level of services we did the year before. Uh, majority of that is uh, staff salary increases that are mandated by contract. And then the next biggest chunk um, is typically uh, the increases in, in healthcare costs. So what we are proposing is a, a $20.2 million budget taking $826,342 from surplus so that we only have to ask the taxpayers for $19.4 million, right? So actually what we would be asking for from the taxpayers um, is what, about $300,000 less than last year? Um, so it was actually a reduction of 1.54% uh, from last year's budget, obviously with the surplus subsidizing that. Um, if we were to look just at the budget from last year to this year and not throw the surplus in there, um, it would be a 2.65% increase. And we kind of talked about that last year. You know, that's what a... Um, that's what a level service budget in this district means is about a 2.6, 2.7% increase um, in expenditures each year. Again, that can be offset by revenues, but we're only looking at expenditures. So before, excuse me, I flip pages here. Um, does this make sense or the questions? I can't see you, so I either put you to sleep or, uh, or I, I did a, a passable job. Um, Expenditures, you know, if we do, do a breakdown of what's new um, that we're proposing for next year, 510,000 of that 523,000 um, is mandatory expenditures. Um, the big bulk um, is the estimate that we did in terms of um, the negotiated salary increase, right? We got to sit back down at the table, get the negotiations done to know what the salary increases are for next year. There are some increases that we already have to pay um, in the steps um, that are in, in the contract. Um, there's also, again, the healthcare uh, increases are astronomical um, year after year. I think this is actually the lowest year I've seen since I've been here. It's usually around 14%, but the cost um, for the district to provide uh, uh, healthcare um, to the district workers is going up by 
The only discretionary money that's in this budget. So in other words, this is money um, that we're, we're adding in for additional things um, um, is $8,000 uh, to support the lower house, right? We've got some structures in place um, that are, are creating a, a true middle school program um, and doing a tremendous amount of revamping of, of, of curriculum and social interactions there um, that's vitally important. And then $5,000 um, to move our tech director onto um, an admin one contract. We have different flavors of administrator's contract. Um, she should never have been on an admin two. Um, she should have always been on an admin one. And so that would correct um, that, that oversight. Um, and so the total cost of the discretionary monies is 13,000. For this to work, Let's see if I can explain this before people get lost in, in reading um, the article um, that is there. We can't take the chance in this vote that folks vote in the lower amount for the budget and then don't vote in the ability to use the surplus funds to supplement it, right? If we're not extremely careful in how we write this, that would have been a distinct possibility. Um, and that would have put us in a really bad spot, right? Because now, you know, they didn't vote in to allow us to use the surplus fund. So now somehow I got to come up with $826,000 to, to make up the difference. So it's very important that folks realize um, what this vote means on this Article 10. And Article 10 is uh, voting on approving the school budget. But the way that this is written, um, if you're voting on this, if you're voting yes, and please vote yes, um, you're really voting on three things. Uh, first thing that you're doing is you are voting to approve the budget and the amounts that I just presented. You are voting to approve the creational of an operational reserve fund account. And you are voting to put last year's surplus monies into that account so that I can use it to subsidize um, the budget in just the way that we discussed. So questions on this, does that make a little bit of sense? Okay. So again, to make sure that um, people didn't vote in half of what we needed to make this work, I've combined the language into one article for folks to vote on. If you're voting on this, you're voting to approve the budget and the dollar amount that, that I uh, has, have just presented. You're voting to approve the creation of the uh, operational reserve fund account and that account will receive with the vote um, the surplus funds so that it can then be used to subsidize uh, the budget. So it's very important and this is kind of this is where I'm going to be spending my time in the next month or so um, as we're, we're getting ready for the March vote and, and talking with folks in the community to make sure that they understand that. The other thing that I want to point out is when you look at that first number there, 21 million, what's he talking about? He said it was 20.2 20, 20 million. Again, 21 million is not coming from the taxpayers. Uh, the 20.2 million that I proposed is but we are required now to put into that number the federal grant monies. So the reason that that number looks a little bit higher is because it's got that about 900,000 in extra dollars that are federal grant monies that do not come from the local taxpayers or the Ed Fund. Lane, can I ask a question? Yeah. This is Hannah Arias. Um, calling it an operational reserve fund, does, does it make sense to be more, it just sounds rather unrestricted to call it an operational fund. Is, is there any pro and or con to being more, to, to um, flushing it out more, or to, to explain more, or to restrict it more? So the, 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 the con, there's a pro and there's a con. Um, these funds, um, that operational reserve fund, if it is established, um, it is under the control of the school board. It's not under my control. If I want to access any of that money to subsidize the budget, I then have to go to the school board and say, I need X amount of dollars to perform this function to subsidize the budget. And you would have to vote as a board to approve that. 
So the, the, there is, is, is control by the board um, over what these funds are used for. Why the choice of operational? Um, because basically what we're doing is if I've got a $20 million budget and I'm taking you know, 800,000 out of that, that money that we're asking for the taxpayers, that reduction um, is not in staffing, it's in the monies that are used to operate the budget. It's paying for the programs and the books. Um, it's not necessarily staff, it's for operational purposes. Um, and so I'm just trying to put the best word on what that money is actually being used for. But you as the school board in knowing the purpose behind that reserve fund have a fiduciary duty to make sure that that's what it's spent for. Um, does that make a little bit of sense? Um, if we get too restrictive, um, then the con is, is the fact that if I have a need to pay for a certain operational com component of the school um, to make sure that you know we're, we're putting it in the full hundred eight hundred and twenty six uh, thousand dollars to support things, um, I may not be able to do it if we make it too restrictive. Um, so it's it's easier to have it open. And again, you are the part of the fiduciary stewards along with me to make sure that it's being spent where where it needs to be spent, and it has to go to a public vote, right? Part of you guys voting on this money in terms of subsidizing the budget is it's public, people are, will see it, it's transparent, they know what you're doing with it and they can call you and they can call me on it if we're not, not doing what's right and what's appropriate. Um, that makes sense. And I, you know, I'm not necessarily arguing that it should be more- No, they're awesome questions. In the, in the nonprofit world, we see something that comes in and says it's for operations, we're thrilled. That basically means unrestricted to us. I'm just wondering if the voters may um question it being uh a a, a big bucket a, a um not a vague bucket but a big but I'm not i mean we could we could call it um you know you know budgetary subsidy fund um but again what it, what, it, what are you using that money for you're using right. it to cover operations that you're not asking for the taxpayers to pay for yeah yeah Thank you. So now you got me thinking. It was a good question. Thank you. Can I just pick Blake up from uh, practice? But uh, I think I like the looks of the budget as it's going, but I'll uh, log back in as soon as I get home. Hey, I appreciate it, Brian. Be safe. Yeah. Lane, I don't know if you can go back to that last slide where it had the the average per pupil. So is that is that number you had mentioned earlier that we, we basically create a bill for for the state? Is that and anything above a certain amount per pupil would come directly from the taxpayers? Yeah. So here, here's here's this slide. So if you look over to the right, and this is a hell of a lot easier. Excuse the language in person because I can point to stuff as I'm talking about it. Um, there are basically uh, three numbers on there. I call them the, the basically there's three thresholds here. That $10,763, um, they call that the property yield. What it really is, is it's how much the state is giving us um, for each enrolled student. You know, give or take some 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 averaging and stuff like that. But this is how much we receive per student. Um, that number is down uh, quite a bit from last year. I think last year it was closer to about ten ten thousand nine hundred. And so this is how um, we're paying for the extra that the Ed Fund didn't have. They reduce what they're giving us um, per student with this property yield. So any money that's uh, uh, above, any cost per student that's above that $10,763 per student, any dollar amount above that comes directly from the local taxpayers. So in our case, it's about $7,000 per student. And, and how about federal funds you'd mentioned earlier that like federal grant money and things that don't come, is that, that's not included in that, right? So, so some of those funds would also come from federal money. So I just wonder what, what does it actually end up being do you think for the actual town to have to have per per pupil? 
I'm not sure the question. So, uh, ask it again for me. Yeah. So you said that 10,763 is what you're going to receive, the, the estimate of what you're going to receive from the state per for the, From the ad fund, yeah. Right. And then, but earlier in the presentation, you also mentioned that there's also federal funds and money that comes in that, that you kind of didn't include. So I wonder, one, when you have federal funds coming in as well, that's obviously kind of being averaged out per pupil. So I wonder, how does, what does that number then look like when the federal funds are put in there? And what, what would it really come down to per student that we're, we, the community, are, are going to pay above and beyond what the state is going to give you through the way the ed, is, ED fund is um, funded? So a very good question, but there's multiple parts there. So right. what you're looking at with the 10763 and the 17719 per student that we're looking at um, for this year to pay overall per student, these are dollar amounts that are associated with local taxes. So these do not include in any way, shape, or form the federal funds. So does that piece make sense in terms of, of separating it out? If you wanted to know the total amount that we're putting into students, um, I can do a rough calculation for you right now. Uh, give me a second to find a calculator. Well, I mean, I, I think you might have answered it just in that. So, so what the eighteen thousand seven hundred eighty-nine per student? That's what we. That's what we're getting. What well, that's what we're basically spending per pupil if you if you pass this budget, right? So let's let's go through this. Um, let me let me let me let me explain each of the three numbers that are up there because they're important. So we've we've talked about the property yield at ten thousand seven sixty three per student. That's what the state is giving us for our uh, for our, our 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 enrollment, right? Per per student, that's what they give us. Anything above that, we pay for out of local taxes. Um, so right now, our cost per student with the with the subsidizing is $17,719 per student. That $18,789 per student that's in red, um, that is a critical threshold. If we push our cost above that, then um, we end up uh, getting a tax penalty um, that kind of doubles any money that we're asking for above that threshold. So that's a threshold you never want to cross. Okay, so I guess that's where my question about the federal funds, because you're saying the 10763 comes from state. Yeah. So, so then we also get some money from the federal government in forms of grants and things. Um, you also said using so using the eight the using the 826,000. Really, what we're going to be up to is 17 17,719 per student. But is that also including the money that we're going to have from the federal grants? No, the, the federal grants are irrelevant. And, and I may be misreading what you're saying. I just want to make sure there's not a misconception there. Um, that 17,719 is dependent upon that $20.2 million budget. It does not matter that we are subsidized, whether we're subsidizing it with surplus or whether it's coming from the taxpayers, that number won't change. Okay. I, I guess where I'm getting lost, and, and we can move on if if, um, if nobody else has the same question. I just wonder how the federal funds get tied into all of this because I, I get that we get money for students from the state, and I yeah. also understand that there's money from the federal government. Um, I wonder where that is in this calculation. I guess how much per student does that equate to when we do get funding through grants? Does that because I'm guessing that helps. Yeah, so it, a, a rough rule of thumb, I don't have a calculator and I can't pull it up on the computer because I'll shut the presentation down. Um, a rough estimate for our federal funding is 900,000. Divide that by 839 kids and that'll give you about how much per student that we get in federal funding. Rough estimate. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, and that so money is in addition, again, it's not included in these numbers. It shouldn't be a part of these numbers, but that would be in addition um, to what is here. To help out students. So would that raise the 17, 719 number? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it won't raise it for tax purposes, but if you want like a true value of money that we are spending on kids, yes, that number would go up. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. that was my question. Yeah, so good question. And sorry, I just wanted to try to make sure I was getting what you were asking. Other questions? 
So we actually, um, you know, through this process, I got the budget summary up here, that 21, 123, right? That's including, including grants. Um, it's assuming that we're gonna be using 826,000 in surplus um, funding uh, for next year's budget to offset things. Um, the combined effect is that is that we're actually decreasing uh, the burden on the taxpayers by, by 1.54% compared to last year. It is keeping us below that kind of critical $18,789 spending threshold. Um, this is actually has improved our, our standings relative to that threshold by $275 per student per year. Um, so we still have a thousand dollars, thousand seventy dollar per student buffer, right? We'd have to, you know, have to be spending a thousand dollars more per student to come anywhere near close to um, that that uh, warning threshold there. All right, it's going to be important before I flip to the next slide. Your job is not to freak out because it doesn't mean what you think it means when you see it. So it's gonna be very important that you let me um, explain this, um, what it means, um, because otherwise people are gonna get confused and think they're gonna be paying a huge amount of extra taxes this year when that is not the case. So when I throw this up here, you know what you are seeing is the equalized tax rate for your town. Equalized is a very special word and there is a reason that they used it because equalized means just that. As one thing moves up, another moves down to compensate for it, so that in the end, when you combine the two, you're in the same place that you started. So based upon um, the equalization, Braintree, you're gonna be paying 16 cents more per $100 of assessed value of your property, but, the value of your property has been assessed much lower than it was. You're paying more per dollar, but the number of dollars has gone down, right? The assessment value of your property has gone down. So in the end, those two things cancel each out, out. They're equalized. You're paying about the same amount as you have in previous years. Does that make sense? Okay. Brookfield. You're going to be paying six cents more per hundred dollars of assessed value, but to compensate and keep things about equal, the assessed value of your properties have gone down moderately, right? You're paying more per dollar that your house is worth, but your house isn't worth as many dollars. Again, things should not be this confusing if people are trying to figure out their taxes. Randolph, you will be paying seven cents more per hundred dollars of assessed value, but the assessment, the assessed value of your homes has gone down moderately to compensate. If you want to know, based on this budget, what you are potentially going to be paying in addition to what you are already paying for taxes relative to the schools, with this budget, you are going to be adding about three and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. What does that mean? The average home value in Vermont is $275,000 right now. Things have changed a little bit because of COVID. So that means on average for the entire year, the average homeowner is going to see a tax increase of $96, which is $8 a month. Now, you see those two big asterisks um, on the top and on the bottom. And this goes back to something that Chris had brought up a little while ago. Um, this is all based upon their current formulas and their current formulas were predicting a big shortfall in the ed fund and it's looking like in recent discussions that they've underestimated the property yield in other words they're actually yielding they're actually getting more money into that ed fund than they thought um, and so that's probably going to be adjusted Robin and I were looking at it today. Um, if the property yield is back up close um, to what it was last year, and there is the very real potential that it will be once they get their final calculations done, um, it's very likely that um, there will be no tax increase, right? Instead of 0.3, in, instead of, uh, you know, three and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed value, it may be zero. 
Um, it certainly, by the looks of things, will, will be better than what I am presenting here. But put things in perspective, we are in the middle of an economic crisis, the likes of which we have not seen in 100 years. Um, and we're talking about keeping the schools running at the same level of service they have been running at um, for a tax increase on average um, of $96 per year, which is $8 a month. Um, also have to remind folks on this um, that if you're a person who has hit the income sensitivity threshold, and that threshold is actually fairly high, they change it from year to year. I didn't get a chance to look up the, the most recent numbers today when I was scrambling around. Um, but if you're at that uh, sensitivity threshold, um, you know, you just fill out that additional form um, as part of your taxes and they reduce your, 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 your tax uh, assessment. Um, so don't forget that. So questions on this. I know the tax piece is confusing. I have to study it again each year and I still, after a day or two, because I don't use it all the time, you know, it, it falls out of my mind and I have to go back and look at it again. Lane, when you're, t when you're talking about the tax rate um, or the assessed value, when we get questions from community members, that assessed value that you're talking about is that state assessed value. It's not the assessed value that the town gives you based for the, your- the, C the CLA. Yeah, it's the, the CLA. So that's a good question. Lane, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel super dense at this point because I'm the only one with all these questions, but can you, so can you explain that a little bit better? Because that was exactly what Ann said. That was kind of what my question was, was where are we seeing this 100, that the assessed value has gone down? Where do we, where do we see that? I guess, you know, like each, each year I take my property taxes and I, I look at that and I see the, 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 the tax rate that the town is charging based on the assessed value of my home. So, but you're so, saying that's not where it's going to be seen? Yeah, so the, the, the town CLA um, for last year was 109%. Um, so your assessment was high, right? These things balance out to equalize each other. Um, you know, your, your, your assessment by the state of the properties um, when it took a look at it, it was high. So that meant that your tax rates were lower, right? You're instead of 16, uh, the, the, the number of pennies that you were paying uh, per hundred dollars of assessed value was lower. Um, what happened in the case of like Braintree is that common level of assessment was 109 last year. This year it's, it's 101. So there was a huge shift um, in assessed value, right? And so that's why you're seeing this huge increase to compensate for that. Again, one goes down, one goes up in the end, it kind of means the same thing in terms of, of what you're paying. What the, te what the actual schools are actually adding to things is this, right? This is staying the same from year to year. The only thing that's going, you know, going on is the, uh, you know, the, the, what you're paying per dollar is changing, but the number of dollars that you're paying it on is changing as well to compensate. The big thing is is here. You're we're with this budget, we're adding about three and a half cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. And it's a hell of a lot more complicated than I'm presenting it, but I'm trying to present it fairly simple. Thank you, Herman. Yeah. Um, in the case of and, and this kind of happened, the, the assessed values were high last year for all three towns. Um, Brookfield was uh, 102 last year, it's 100 this year. Uh, Randolph was 103 and it's 100 to 101 this year. Um, so again, um, in all cases, assessed values went down, right? So the, the number of dollars that you have to pay on went down, but what you're paying per dollar goes up because of that to keep things about equal. So good questions. So are there other questions on, on this piece here? <laughs> Silence. Either, either people's brains are burning up, or or we're okay. Okay. So I'm throwing this up here. Um, it was kind of um, within the budgets, um, but this is actually. Let's go back before we do this, because this is actually a separate vote. Um, uh, 
Laura, what I'll I'll do is we've kind of completed you know the presentation that I've got for the OSSD budget, um, and I'll I'll let you determine if you you guys want to dis have discussion, if you want to vote, if there's more questions. Well, first, then, are there any more questions for Lane about about this uh, OSSD budget, either from board or from any other public? Uh, it's Katja. No question. I just want to um, thank you for this presentation. I think it was really helpful and informative. So if we vote yes on this budget, um, we will also, I assume, Lane, be voting yes to create this operational reserve fund and um, move some of that money, if it is approved, into um, reducing the budgetary uh, weight on the towns yeah so basically what you're doing um is you vote if you vote yes on the budget um you are also voting pretty much yes on the warrant and the way that it's written okay. um if that makes sense yeah no i think that's the best way to do it is that you know that's really what we're approving is is this whole proposal um, which does okay. include the operational reserve fund yeah and and that's the way the warrants the warrants written. So, uh, if there are no further questions for Lane, is there a motion to approve the OSSD budget and all that it encompasses, including the, you know, the uh, operational reserve fund as written in the town warning? Uh, is there a motion to approve it uh, as written? I'll move that we. Uh, approve the budget as written and the warrant as written in the presentation. No second that. Any further questions or discussion before we go to a vote? All right, hearing none, um, I'll do the same roll call. Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. Uh, Brian, I believe, is still not here. Um, so I'll skip over to Meg. Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I am also in agreement. So we are uh, seven with one abstaining or absent, I guess, is a better way to say it. Thanks very much for all that information, Lane. Um, that was real helpful. Laura, um, can you tell me who seconded it? I missed that. Who seconded in the motion? That was me, Linda Kacha. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lane, was there anything else you wanted to present? Um, it seemed like you had one more slide, or are you? Yeah, there yeah, there's a couple of things that we don't want to miss, and, and I promised Chris some, some more data on the uh, the reserve funds, too. I want to make sure we hit. Um, you also have to vote on the announced tuitions um, for next year. Um, in most cases, it was kind of already contained in the votes that you did, but it, it should also be a standalone separate vote. Um, so these are the tuitions that outside folks coming into the district uh, would pay to participate um, in our programs. So at Raven, and we've kind of talked about where the number came from, it would be 26,693. Um, for the tech center for next year, it would be 17,679. Um, if they're coming in to attend one of our elementary schools under the school choice program, it would be 14,866. And if they're coming in to attend our UHS, um, under the school choice programs, it would be 18,630. And I can ask, oh, go ahead. What, what does that 18,630 differ from the previous figure, which you said was 177 something? Um, it's the, when Robin was kind of doing uh, predictions about the overall cost to students, and I believe including um, monies uh, from the federal grant piece. Um, this is probably getting close to that number that Chris was looking at, because um, it gets us uh, to the actual cost that you know we're providing for kids. We're not trying to, not trying to charge more, uh, but we want to make sure that we're breaking even relative to the other students. 
Does that also balance out considering that, you know, Randolph Elementary or any of the elementary schools are at 14, 866, so the 17 was more of an average for all pupils though in the OSSD, and that's why there's different prices. Yeah. And um, again, these are would be what people would pay through school choice um, to be able to attend their district. Any further questions for Lane around announced tuitions? Is there a motion to approve the announced tuitions as presented? This is Katja, I move to approve the announced tuitions as presented. Seconded, Hannah. All right. Um, I'll, uh, I guess we can do a roll call again. Um, if there's no further discussion, um, Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. I'll skip over Brian, who's not returned. Meg? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Aye. And I also agree. All right, thank you. All right. Is that all for you? Okay. <laughs> this, Chris, this is this is uh, the answer to your your question. This is currently what is in um, each of the four um, currently existing reserve funds. Um, there's 2.8 million um, to cover facilities works, 1.2 million for transportation, which is you know replacing the buses, replacing the vehicles. Um, we started to build a special education fund in anticipation um, of the transition to the block grant funding that is coming in case you know we have unexpected expenses in the middle of the year, and then we um, have been keeping some money in a, a legal fund um, given that the fact that um, negotiations with uh, with the union have been yearly um, and those tend to be a little bit more costly than, than a normal year so just in case um, so that's currently what's in those reserve funds um, so if you're tapping into these next year considering that you basically i mean with your proposed budget you've found a way to actually kind of level fund us um for for spending this coming year would these only be tapped into if there were like you've said in the past the roof is probably the most common example that you said is that the only time that these would be tapped into yeah these are only tapped into um you know we're, we're expected to put um normally anticipated expenses into the budget which is what's there these are kind of for the bigger things you know capital capital things um bigger things above above and beyond um you know, or unexpected uh, events. You know, we tapped into the facilities um, fund this year. I can give you a perfect example and, and we'll get reimbursed for it in the end, but we needed the money up front um, to hire two additional um, custodians um, to help keep up with the disinfectant and the cleaning because of COVID, um, right? That was a facilities request that was approved by the board a few months back. So that's an example of what it's used for. And actually, Chris, later in this meeting, we're going to look at uh, taking out from the transportation fund money to replace three buses. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And, and I just wonder, once that money's in there, can the, if you were to ever need to to shift it around, is that impossible, or do you just need to go to voters again for the town, or, or how does that yeah. work once the money's are you, actually? You hit it. it. You hit it right on the head. Um, the voters are the ones that chose uh, the category of things it could be used for when they placed it into the accounts. So let's say that, you know, we decided it was uh, appropriate. We had a need to shift some money from facilities to the transportation fund. That would require a full town vote across the three towns to do. But it is yeah. doable. It is doable. Yeah. Thank you. So good questions. The only um, other thing that I... I see there, and I apologize, Laura, I just want to make sure, um, and you probably are on it anyway. I kept calling it the warrant. It's the, the annual warning. There are more articles in the Article 10, um, so we would need to, to vote to approve that warrant as, as written that, that folks have a copy of. Right, and that 
anything on the agenda. The annual warning was actually um, not part of our agenda packet, but it was emailed to us by Linda under separate cover, I believe. Yeah, we just, like I said, we got the numbers this afternoon. So we were scrambling around um, when we got the final surplus numbers. Yeah, I'm just looking for it on my other screen here. Uh, Linda, was that today? I think it was. Um, yes, this afternoon, I don't know, maybe 2, 2.30, I'm thinking. Okay. Um, so there, yes, yeah, so I can see it. Um, I don't know if the other um, board members had time to look at it, but um, this is what we will be voting on next. We will all need to sign this. And this is um, something that we will have uh, to, uh, to vote on first at the annual school district meeting on Monday, March 1st. And then this was, will be actually um, the wording for what the voters will approve um, when they vote on the budget on, I guess, March 2nd. So um, I don't know if, 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 has everyone had time to look over the wording for this uh, annual warning? Uh, most of it is pretty routine. Really the most um, sort of important part is the wording of exactly what we just approved, that lane of the budget uh, wording, which transfers money into this operational reserve fund and defines how much um, we're gonna be asking the the voters to approve. The rest of it is is pretty routine, um, just electing moderators and clerks, etc. So if we are able to, I would like to have a motion to approve the um, draft warning as, as presented. Uh, this is Ashley. I make a motion that we present the draft warning as presented. Is there a second? I second that I'll motion, ahead. Hannah. Okay, um, let's have a vote on it then. Um, and I think it is easiest just to do it by roll, roll call since most people can't see all of us at once. So um, if there's no further discussion, I will uh, move to a vote. Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. Uh, Brian's still not here. So Megan? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I'm also in favor. Great. All right. Thank you. And next, we have a report on negotiations. Lane? So it looks like um, it looks like they're uh, were able to try to arrange. Um, Chris sent an email probably just a little before the board meeting um, that they've got some dates potentially set aside for uh, looks like the first week of February. Um, to hopefully begin the process. Um, and so uh, the people that are on that committee should take a look and get back with him um, on, you know, whether or not that works. Um, at this point in time, there are a couple of things, and actually it's Chris, are you still here? Yeah, you are. Um, to to kind of talk about so that we're both double checking. Um, we had the... We had last year's contract that both sides kind of agreed upon and the board actually voted to approve it, assuming the wording in the written document comes back, um, you know, the way, way that it was intended. Um, I'm going to check with Pietro tomorrow. If you can check with Stuart. Um, what had happened was they sent it to me. At, uh, Stuart was doing the updates. I, I give him a lot of credit because it's, it's a lot of work. Um, he'd sent it uh, to me and Pietro um, at Thanksgiving, just before Thanksgiving, I reviewed it over Thanksgiving. I sent it back um, to them because uh, it was missing the language on healthcare. And after I sent it back, I have not heard a peep since. Um, so it might be sitting on Stuart's desk. It might be sitting on Pietro's. If we both check tomorrow, maybe we can get that thing wrapped yeah, up. Yeah, I'm just so I did speak. I spoke with Stuart this afternoon, and Stuart had we had received your um, your comments and stuff from from before Thanksgiving, like you, like you said, we received those on the, the December 15th is when we got them. We sent them back to Pietro with corrections and stuff on December 16th. And that, so that was the last we'd heard. So um, if you check with Pietro, then yeah. that might be where, and I'm sure he's really busy with everything going on as well. So that might be where things got held up. Um, but we sent those back on December 16th. And I believe Stuart was also gonna reach out to Pietro uh, today as well. So. 
Yeah, I'll shoot him an email tonight because that's good that we can we can try to wrap that up. The other piece that's related um, to negotiations is that when we were doing discussions about the support staff, um, about you know potentially maybe restoring some sick time, we had reached a tentative agreement um, about that in the final meeting. Um, Laura was there as well. Um, Stuart had offered to do a first draft of that potential language that was agreed to. Um, I'm not sure where that sits, if that's still with Stuart or, or Pietro. Um, it'd be nice to get that wrapped up as well. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll reach out to Pietro on that one too to make sure it's not sitting on his desk. Um, if you want to reach out with Stuart. That was support staff. Uh, say that again? That was, you said that was for support staff? Specifically for support staff, yeah. It was about potentially returning some sick time um, from last year if they could provide a doctor's note um, showing that it was of medical necessity that rose to the level of what we put in the current MOUs. Okay, yeah, I'll check with the steward on that one. Thank you. Yeah. And then, you know, we just talked about a little while ago, you know, where, where we're standing on the, the, the current negotiations that are coming up. Um, we did talk, I sent a, sent a message and I just, I want to think that this is important to discuss. Um, as of tonight, um, as of the board's vote a little while ago, the budget is locked. Um, they have to vote that budget about this time. There's not a lot of flexibility this month um, because they, they need a certain amount of time to make that vote public so people can consider it before March, um, the March 2nd vote. Um, what that means um, is that I've had to estimate, you know, what a potential increase for staff salaries would be. If we get into negotiations um, and folks come back dramatically higher than that, I'm going to have to do risks to cover it um, at this point in time. Um, because again, the budget's a fixed amount, it is set. So I want to put that caution out there to folks, um, which is, you know, hopefully, you know, for getting the negotiations done ahead of time. I kind of had, had mentioned that a, a month or so ago to folks. Um, I don't want to go down that path. Um, and hopefully the other issue there is that if negotiations go beyond about mid-March, um, and things are not resolved, that's potentially, again, putting me in a position to have to riff just to make sure that I'm preserving the potential sanctity um, of the budget because I am not allowed to go into the red under, under the regs. Um, and the reason that it would have to happen by March um, 15th is because I need time to get the riffs out by the April 15th deadline in the contract. So I do not want to go down that road. Um, there's no reason for it. It should not be necessary if, if both sides here, both of us, us, us and you can get our act together and get this done. But to speed the process along, I'm going to kind of reiterate um, you know, my statements from earlier this year. Um, since this is a one-year contract, right, because um, folks are back at the table at the state level um, working on health care uh, again, um, that we just focus on salary, bang it out, get it done, get every, everybody happy and in a good place. And then my suggestion is, is that if there are language issues for the contract, that hopefully after that state negotiation is done on health care, pictures will be a lot clearer, um, and hopefully we can get a multi-year contract. Um, uh, which I think would would, would be awesome. Um, so anyway, just 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 my thoughts on the matter, um, if possible. Um, but I, I would like to chime in for a second. On that. Yeah. So I think I think what you hit on is that is is what's been unfortunate is that we have gone into yearly negotiations where you know yeah. five years ago we used to negotiate once every three years, maybe two years, but they were typically two or three year contracts. And what what's really been the result of that is that. Um, we're constantly pushed back and pushed back and we can't really start a new negotiation session without knowing what the previous contract is. So, so I mean, on, to be honest, we, we have it in our contract that we reach out to the board. I sent a letter of intentions to negotiate for this year way back in September, but it just wasn't the reason that we're now into pushing the budget season and, and you don't have that picture is, is because of the nature of how that's worked over the past few years. Um, so that that's just one piece. Um, so that people understand i think i think we would all love to get back to a point um that we're doing multi-year contracts and i know that there are complications with that but but it isn't set in stone that this is a, a one-year contract there have been districts that have done multi-year contracts even despite the fact of what's going on at the state level i know there's been two-year contracts settled in the 
like last year, even though most districts are settling at one year. So again, that's something that just happens at the negotiations table on how many years that's going to happen. There are complications, as you said, because of what the state's been doing, things that are totally beyond the board and the association's control. So. Yeah, no, and, and and again, we're just just trying to figure it out to to get things going. And I'm hoping that at least at the state level that they're going to be negotiating. You know, my guess is it'll be a two year on the healthcare, which then locks us into two year contracts. But you know, that's better for everybody to be able to actually focus on 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 the work of the district. Um, I know it's it's difficult on 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 you. It's difficult on us. It takes takes up quite a bit of, uh, a bit of time. It's it's worth it, um, but it it is unusual compared to you know previous decades um, that we're always at the table. Yeah, yeah. We get to a point where it's multi-year contracts. Then we don't get behind, and then when we actually are negotiating, you have a better idea as we head into the budget. Yeah. The budget season, so. No, no, agreed. So um, more about if the state can get their act together, I guess, and, and come up with some decisions than than ours. Okay. Oh yeah, agreed. So it is that he, uh, Chris, t I give him, give him a lot of credit. He did get some dates out um, this afternoon um, for February. So if folks can just take a peek at that and we can get this ball rolling, um, which would be good. Hey, Chris, just out of curiosity, since you're here, and if you don't have an answer right now, that's okay. Um, you had put out like four dates. Um, would it be possible to potentially, even though they're all like in the same week, would it be potential potentially possible to do you know multiple meetings in one week? You know maybe two. Try to yeah. get it going. So typically we, I mean we don't need to waste everybody's time talking about it. But yeah, typically we're like once every month, um, so that there's plenty of time to go through things. It's probably something we should talk about at the in our first meeting. We will discuss the dates that setting future dates. So that's definitely something we can look at when we get into it. Um, right now, our the. Part of the reason we didn't meet at the beginning of January now um, is because Pietro's been booked. So up. Yep. those initial dates that were sent out, we tried to get the ball rolling in the beginning of January, but because Pietro wasn't available, really we're, what we've found is we're going more off Pietro's schedule than anybody else's schedule. So we're, that's why, that's what those dates are. And as long as um, he hasn't been booked on those dates by the time everybody gets back to me and then I can get back to him, then that's totally a possibility, I would say. Yeah, no, I'm sure he's negotiating other groups, but this actually, I, this was good to be able to talk together and, you know, just kind of set some ideas as we're going in. So I appreciate that. Can I ask a quick question? Because I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, is that just for professional staff? I'm not really hearing support staff negotiations dates. It's uh, it's it's for both. Um, I have not heard um, much. I know that... Um, there were, was an illness um, that prevented, you know, the possibility for a little while, mm -hmm. um, but that should be getting back on the table too as the support staff. Okay, yeah. so these dates that you're discussing are just for the professional staff. For the teachers, the okay. CBA, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so good. All right, um, let's move on here. Um, next, we, we have two uh, EL reports. 2.4 and 2.5 both were presented last month and I hope that um, board members had a chance to read them over again. Um, I did have just one question on the financial one, Lane. Um, you know, back then when you presented it, there was one sort of questionable thing about tech center finances. Has that all been sort of ironed out? Yeah, we talked about that in executive session um, a little, little bit. Um, we do have folks going in, taking a look at all the parts and pieces there. Um, outside of things being late, um, in some cases dramatically late, things are as they should be from what we can see. And we did, uh, we did at that time, we did notify the auditor um, just to make sure that we had an outside set of eyes on things as well. Yeah, yep. that's what I was asking about. Yeah. So, okay. so at this point in time, as we're 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 speaking with everything that people are looking at, um, thing things look pretty good. Yep. Any other questions for Lane around EL uh, two point four or two point five? Hearing none, let's approve them both um, with one vote. Um, can I have a motion, please, to approve? Uh, both monitoring report 2.4 and 2.5? I move to approve monitoring <laughs> reports. Thanks, Ashley, 2.4 and 2.5. Uh, I will second Hannah's. 
Is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, let's uh, have a vote to approve those. Um, Anne? Aye. Ashley? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Katja? Aye. Brian? I guess he's not here yet. Uh, Meg? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I agree as well. Thank you, um, everyone. And thank you, Lane. All right, next, I gotta go back to my agenda page here. Um, all right, so we've got the consent agenda. Um, all of these we will vote, uh, approve the one, uh, well, we'll approve the first three, and then we're gonna hear from um, Danny Bellavance about the um, transportation re reserve fund expenditure. Um, and so we'll have a separate vote on the um, on the bus money. There, that will have to be there's, facilities. there's one update um, to that consent agenda. I am going to recommend, oops, sorry. I don't know if that's me or somebody else. I'm going to recommend to the board um, that they remove the approval of the benefit plan um, from that. Um, the rationale is that there's nothing wrong with it. Um, we are transitioning our uh, HRA, HSA uh, provider this year after many difficulties with uh, DataPath um, to a company called Further. Um, this is their agreement, you know, the services that they will provide. Um, we had sent this out uh, a while ago um, to Visbit um, because their legal service um, to look over to make sure that it's appropriate for us to be signing. We have not heard back from Visbit yet. So um, while I am sure that everything there is right and appropriate, um, I'm not comfortable um, suggesting that the board or recommending to the board that they approve that until we hear back from council. Um, so that would uh, so require- So there would be two things because we've already approved the announced tuitions previously. So we just have minutes from our, our regular meeting on December 14th and minutes from our special meeting last Monday. Um, are there any substitutions or additions or subtractions, uh, corrections of those uh, on those minutes? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from those two meetings? So moved. Ms. Kacha. Second. Uh, I second, this is Ashley. Uh, all those in favor, please wave or say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, uh, so next is to approve the transportation reserve fund expenditure. Today we um, received a, a letter from um, one of the transportation people, uh, Danny, and would you like to speak on behalf of this? <clears throat> sure, I can introduce myself here. I thank you for allowing me this time here to uh, make my proposal there to have uh, three buses uh, to be purchased to get into the transition of uh, trading out three older buses. I don't know if you've had my reports in front of you or not, but we're running into a, a, an issue here with our buses having uh, over 100,000 miles on them. And of course, the wear and tear on the back roads and uh, the rot in the body, I've sent a couple of pictures out too, but it's time to start thinking about replacing three of the older buses. Typically, I think we've been in the past history of replacing two every year. We haven't been able to do that. This is my fourth year here, and I believe we've only purchased three buses. And part of those that we have purchased was uh, to increase our fleet when we entered, enter, introduced Rochester and the Chelsea School. We added two buses to our fleet. So not counting that, we've only replaced one bus or purchased one new bus with our old one. So now we're getting to the point where instead of doing two every year, which we have not been doing, we're starting to get behind a little bit. So now we're finding ourselves, uh, I believe it was in 2014 that there was a grant program where the district took advantage of the grant program and they purchased three buses. So that's a couple of years down the road. So we're falling into a position now where we need to rotate the buses out. I think if we get three this year, then we can go back to the two every year uh, or a little bit. But we do have 14 buses in all in our fleet. They're very well maintained. The only thing is, is 
um, the wear and tear, uh, the, the body fatigue is getting to be where either we're going to do a lot of repair work on them, or we can just get into the rotation of the purchase of new buses. I did <clears throat> uh, get approximate cost of vehicles from three different vendors. And what's interesting is the vendor that we're currently or have been using for the last several years has offered us an opportunity to purchase buses less than last year's cost. And it's about $3,000 less than the other two vendors that um, I received bids for. The $84,000 from our current vendor, Cressy, is significant savings compared to Anderson at $87,800 or Clark's truck center in Jericho at $88,090 per bus. So I believe we can take advantage of this opportunity by purchasing three buses at less than last year's cost for the replacement of the three buses that I have at over 100,000 miles. We are going to replace the three buses with 100,000 miles on them. Uh, we'll still be maintaining them. They're 72 passenger buses. They do meet all the requirements. What's interesting though is the purchase of the buses that we're getting from our current vendor, Cressy, uh, has an option that other vendors don't have and that's the differential lock option. What that means are the dirt roads that we have and the uphills and the downhills, we're able to lock in the differential so we can have like all the wheels in the back of the bus going at the same time. The other two vendors don't have that differential lock option. So I think we're, at, ahead by keeping the current vendor, keeping the current fleet the same, Thomas bus with a Cummings engine, all the parts and pieces are all the same for the whole fleet, rather than going from Thomas to Anderson to Bluebird or to an international bus. We can save the $3,000 staying with the same vendor, same relationships, and take advantage of the ability for Cressy to buy buses directly from the manufacturer. They eliminate the middleman. Where international bus, you have to go through a middleman. I think that's why the difference in price of three to four thousand dollars, we're able to go more direct. So my proposal would be for the district to maintain the uh, the vehicles to have three purchased this year and then two next year, and then maybe we can do one for a while, uh, getting them to last ten years is asking a lot, but I think if we can maintain them like we have been and keep them between nine and 10 years, it's to our advantage. After that, it gets expensive. We start replacing the turbos, the doors, the windows, the replacement costs of the parts and pieces to keep older buses will far outweigh the cost of a monthly payment, I guess is how I look at it. So my request would be for the board to approve the, the purchase of three buses tonight right. and we can get ordered. I see that it, it would, your total is a two, two, $264,270 um, in front of the Transportation Reserve Fund. Yeah, and that was based on the more expensive of the buses. Um, I'm gonna suggest we leave it at that, um, just to, it, just in case, um, if Danny goes with Cressy, it's it's actually about two hundred and fifty three thousand. Correct. Um, yeah. Did you say that we the three that we're replacing? What happens to those three? Like, can are they like cars where you can it has trade in value or anything? <laughs> what happens? What what they'll do? That's a good question. What he'll do? Brian Cressy will come to Vermont on his one trip through New England that he makes. And he'll take a look at our buses and he'll evaluate them. And I don't have the numbers that he gave us for trade-ins of previous buses when I first uh, came here three years ago. Of course, they were old buses then, but you know, you can probably, I'm hoping he can get three to $4,000 for them and take that towards the trade-in. You know, we have a well-maintained fleet. I give a lot of credit to Reggie Magnet. Uh, they're well maintained for what we do the oil the grease the brakes the tires uh the doors and all that <clears throat> and so when they do come they see 
that they've been well maintained. I like to keep them clean as well too, but you know, just uh, have that advantage of the records all in the file so they can see the parts and pieces that we've taken the time to list and give them in the file when they come to trade them in, it'll add to the cost, I believe, or add to the value of the trade-in. So I'm hoping, you know, $4,000 for the buses that he'll see, but of course that's up to him. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, you know, the big the big joke, and it's it's actually impressive if you've seen the roads that um, those buses have to go over some of them. It's actually amazing that they last as long as they do. So, the one thing that saves them a lot is we do get them with air ride, and I believe that adds at least two years of of running or operational years to them, to their life. Instead of trading them in every eight years, you can perhaps get closer to 10 years of that air ride. I've been to school buses without air rides in a previous district out there in, in Harwood, and you'll see the dirt roads that they run without air ride and a rivet starts coming out of the bus. It just shakes them to death. But here, uh, these these buses are well maintained and they're in good shape for the shape they're in, I guess. Any further discussion before we take a vote? Is there a motion to approve $264,270 um, from the transportation fund to cover the purchase of three new passenger buses? So moved. Uh, second. second. This is Ashley. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please wave or say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, that passes. All Thanks. right. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Again, who made the motion? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have the board evaluation. Meg? Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm oh. sorry. I skipped a whole, I skipped a whole reports and incidentals. Sorry about that. I was getting a little ahead of myself. All right. So we've got the superintendent's report, um, which looks like your annual report. Um, Lane, do you have anything to add or comment on that? Yeah, no, that was just following through on the past tradition. As always, you know, this report was the annual report from the superintendent. Um, ben uh, Merrill will work with that. We'll dress it up a little bit to get it into the, the brochure for the district. So. Okay, and then we had director and principal's reports. Um, we had a financial report. How are we doing? <laughs> Actually, we're doing really well. Um, the only area right now that is out of whack, uh, Robin and I talked for a little while this afternoon um, and looking things over is um, food services. Um, and part of the reason for that is right now, all, all students are getting free lunch, you know, free breakfast under um, the extension of the summer food program um, that the government put out to make sure that all students were getting fed during COVID. Um, so a lot of that is just waiting for the reimbursements. Um, uh, and we do fully expect to get reimbursed for the total um, dollar amount of that. Um, but again, it took, you know, COVID started in March and we got our first grant money rolling in and around November. Um, so, you know, there is usually a, a significant delay in these things, but that's the only thing that's out of whack right now. Any other incidentals or any other questions from board members for Lane on around these uh, reports? Okay, now you're up, Meg, the board evaluation. All right. Um, so I I gave us uh, met our best expe expectations um, pretty much across the board, um, except for I did dock a few points on following the agenda. We're a little sidetracked and with questions, um, the meeting proceeded without interruptions or distractions, but otherwise good. All right. Thank you. Um, is there a need for an executive session, Lane? You probably don't want the answer, but yeah, we should. There's a couple things we should talk about. Yeah. And so what I'll do is um, while folks are talking, I'm going to I'll shoot a remote session out to folks for it. 
Okay, and just so that uh, everyone else knows, um, following the executive session, we're going to reconvene in public session and we're gonna just have a brief 15 minute sort of training or a reminder about what open meeting laws require of us via email and uh, things like that. So um, we will come back to public session after our executive session. All right, do I have a motion to, uh, to move into executive session? I'll move that we move into an ex executive session at 8.46 p.m. To is it personnel? Uh, is it for personnel? Uh, student, student, student and personnel. Student and personnel information that's private. Is there a second? Second. This is Hannah. Okay. So I've asked Rachel to lead this discussion since she's our knowledgeable one about this sort of thing. So she's going to. Go ahead. Thanks. What I know is included in the um, the document I sent out about. Do we need to uh, state that nothing was nothing no action was taken in uh, executive session? Yes, we do. Uh, no, we don't. I'm no action that. was taken in executive session. Correct, Brian. Thank you. Um, so, um, I guess I'll start with: Do people have particular questions about? the open meeting laws. I think. I think it's just worth being really, I know you sent that stuff and I read it and I tried to ingest it. And um, I think that just verbalizing really clearly what can be emailed, what can't, what can be an executive session, what can't. Yeah, I read it over and over, and it doesn't it doesn't stick with me except kind of the general gist of it. So I actually carried that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns um, thing. I carried that around with me for a while, so I could like when every time I came to a meeting, so I'd have it with me in my bag. But um, I found that helpful. And Lane had a copy from the Vermont Secretary of State, something similar from the Vermont Secretary of State's office. Um, that I can forward to you if you if you're interested. It's really just a summary of the law that applies to public bodies um, that have dialogue. Um, so the two things that seem to be um, applicable to our board include the what can be shared by email. Um, how does email become a meeting that needs to be shared publicly? Um, so I guess I'll start with that and then and then we'll hit quickly on um, What's the other thing? Uh, executive session and what can be discussed in executive she executive session, um, or when a board can meet privately. So let me find my version of of it, because um, I have I have lanes open, but I want I'm more familiar with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. So bear with me for a second. I know it's late. Okay, so um, so the Vermont City League of Cities and Towns tells us a good deal about about how to be careful about email, and I included most of it in in the email that I sent about the open meeting law. Um, basically, if an if an email, so so anytime we are discussing something that we may vote on, that should not be included in email. Um, that shouldn't be something that's discussed in email. So. Anything, any actionable item should not be discussed in amongst us in email. Um, anytime there's a quorum of us together, meaning half our board. Actually, does it have to be more than half our board? Laura, do you know? Do we have to have a majority? Do we have to have five of our eight? I, I was reading it today. It has to be a majority. So I was mm -hmm. like, so what makes a majority when we have eight people? Is it four or is it five? And yeah, it has to be five. It can't, can't be discussed in the email, but can be put in the email. And then somebody can reply and say, we put that on the agenda, right? Okay. So point of clarification. <laughs> um, 
So you can so you can bring something up in an email, but it can't. But then it, something that could be voted on an actionable item can be brought up in email, but the reply should be let's put that on an agenda or let's discuss that in an open meeting instead of a dialogue. So we shouldn't be having dialogue on email about actionable items. Um, if we do, then that's then that's all public. Then we're in violation of the of the open meeting law, and and this, and we can be sued for that. Um, the document that I sent has a way has how we how we cure it um, or how we fix it if that happens, and all the documents that we've shared are public. Um, all the emails become are are public. They are public. Um, so a quorum, we just so we just discussed the quorum. I think another thing to mention is that um, if we have subcommittees, um, the same the same rules apply. Also, we've over the last few years we've lost some board members, and occasionally we will have a board we'll have a board meeting where there are very few of us present, um, and you still need you you need even if we have a vacant spot on the board, you still need the quorum of the eight, not you know if, if so, you know, Paul was missing or um, Brooke was missing and we had a smaller number, we still needed five to make a quorum because our board is a board of eight, even if there's an empty slot. Um, questions so far? <laughs> Does Dan want to join us? <laughs> Yeah, he, he offered. I was like, I was, I was like, I think, and I think he, I heard him whisper it. But I think one of the things too is like just not hitting reply all is a good way to not. Yeah. Hang on, um, is is a good way not to um, be in violation of that. So replying individually and you know potentially just to your chair. Um, Before I take public questions, Rachel. But sure. I just wondered so. I don't have the document that you sent, so I'm just curious. It, it, you said that if you were in violation, there's a way to resolve that. So if Here there, so so if there was, if there was, could you just touch on what that is and and how the yeah. public know that that was being resolved? I guess. Sure. So it so it wouldn't correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it wouldn't need to be cured unless a member of the public said, "Hey, you all had a meeting, or you all discussed something that that you shouldn't have discussed." It, unless, it, and then it has it has to be recognized before it has it, before it needs to be cured. Um, if it's through email, then how are how is anybody in the public supposed to know rather than trust that you're not doing it? I guess that's right. my question. Recognize it yourself. Can you, do you, do you want to talk? Are you able to talk? That's fine. So this is, this is my husband. He's on the Braintree Select Board. His name is Daniel. He is, um, he kind of pointed me in the direction of this thing because I like rules and I like to know the rules and I like to follow the rules. So um, he's also an attorney, but he's not giving, he's not giving legal advice. <laughs> he's just helping me interpret the law. Uh, so a couple things that, it, the, as far as your question of how do you resolve it and how do you cure it, it doesn't have to be the public that recognizes the issue. If the board recognizes an issue on their own, they can self cure. But it basically, the, you can read it, but it basically to cure it, you just publish it. You present it to the public and that's how you cure it, right? You say, oh, somebody hit reply all. Now we have to do this. The other problem with also is not just reply all, it can be because Katya, you said something about individually replies. If you get five individual replies, that still counts instead of one reply all. Right. Okay. Or a chain. So if one person forwards it to another who forwards it to another and five people get on the chain, that also constitutes a quorum. So it's not just a reply all issue. Okay. I'll step back. You need the, you need the quorum and, and the email. So it, it's not like if two of you were to have a conversation or three of you were, it had to be that it involved more than. Right. Yeah. So that was the five. problem. But just to give some historical perspective. For the Brain Tree Select Board, it used to have three members, but that meant that two people couldn't talk to each other. Because as soon as two people spoke about something, you had a quorum and it was a meeting. So at that point, they decided to go to five members because that allows two people to talk about something and you haven't created a meeting, you're having a discussion about an issue that's not a public forum. So that's how that plays out. Thank you for clarifying. Questions? 
and then executive session. Um, so what can be dis discussed in executive session? Let me see. I keep losing that document. I have it open and I keep, I can't remember which tab it's under. <laughs> All right. Um, so executive session or when can a board meet in private? And basically there are two instances where a board or, or two um, types of meeting where a board can meet in private and they are deliberative session and executive session. Deliberative session we don't use much. It's about um, acting as a quasi judicial body. I think at times we have perhaps um, actually met in deliberative session, but uh, but called it executive session when we were, when we um, discuss hearings that we've had, um, grievances. Um, but anyway, executive session is it, it's pretty it's pretty strict and limited in what we can um, what what we can talk about. And really, it's um, like for us, it's the it's confidential staff issues. It's conf confidential student issues anything else personnel evaluations employments firings things like that yeah um real estate I, I a, yeah, yeah. About when when we were trying to figure out our design team i was thinking we did do that okay because that's sort of there was a thing in here the appointment or employment so we were appointing people to be on the design team so we did that, we sort of talked about that in executive session. Mm -hmm. so that was an appropriate use of it, executive session, because we were because we were appointing people. Right? Or not really, or I mean, because we were kind mm -hmm. of it was sort of, but it was like people were volunteering to be a part of a group. So is that appointing somebody or is that you know, I know what not I mean? I would guess not really. Sorry, this is Daniel jumping in again. No, Just that's, because okay. that's more that I think, and if Lane is on there, whoever you know, can try to correct me, but that's Lane's more for a municipal body because we have appointed positions on certain commissions. So like a zoning commissioner or planning board or things like that, where they're an appointed position and it's truly in the statutes as an appointed position. So that there is a, there is a strict statutory definition of what an appointed position is. So I would say, unless it falls into that, it's not necessarily. Um, I have a question, a clarifying question. So the executive session does not, and this is this is not a personal thing at all, but it does not automatically include Lane, correct? Correct. So we can, okay. Um, Cause I feel like, it's and he m most uh, frequently has the issues that we or brings the issues right. that we discuss in executive session but um there have been times that i thought really the question should be put to all of us does anyone right have something to bring to executive session um and then it could be with him or without him okay thank you yeah so like when we if we want to discuss lane's evaluation we can do that in executive session. So uh, I have another. I, I have another question because when I when I said when I did the the motion to go into executive session, when I was reading before, it's like you're supposed to be like referencing the law, <laughs> which is yeah. like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah, like, I it. don't remember exactly. So I was like, oh, for privacy and something else, I just sort of added on there. But that is part of what we kind of need to be doing, which means we may need to like slow down and, and be able to pull this document up and re-reference like the the reason, you know, yeah, you in, the, the, in the legal. You need to have the statutory reference there. You need to say for personnel issues under 301 D3 or A3 or whatever it is. I forget the citation. But, <clears throat> but yeah, you have to say each one. So generally the biggest ones are, are legal issues. So if there's a lawsuit or a pending lawsuit or litigation, if there's a real estate purchase, for personnel issues, which is fairly broad, but generally it's evaluations and 
terminations and personnel problems, uh, contract negotiations, wage issues. Yeah, I'm trying so to think of the other Sometimes thing. when Lane has something, we don't necessarily know exactly what the issue is. So that's something that the board chair, well, and does he know right from the, I don't know if during the, no, because not necessarily. This time he didn't know. He said he didn't think we would need an executive session. And then there were several issues that came up, personnel, et cetera, yeah. in the between time. So I don't, is he able to say, yes, we do need to go into executive session because, uh, I mean, he always says, yeah, for a personnel issue or a student issue, mm -hmm. um, which are definitely legitimate reasons to be in private session, mm -hmm. but, you know, he, we never reference like under which oh, statutes. Wow. Right. And I don't think, I don't think we're actually required to, but oh. the Vermont League of Cities and Towns recommends it. Yeah. Oh, we're not required to. Oh, phew. I don't think we're required to, but it's recommended. Okay. And then to confirm, we need to vote to enter executive session, right? Yes. But we don't need to vote to exit. Correct. Okay. You just say it's over and state whether you made where you, whether there's an action or take a vote if you have to take a vote based on what happened. And state um, the time, correct? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. And then if a decision is made in executive session, we have to discuss our reasoning. Don't isn't that isn't that right? On certain things, yeah. Certain things. Well, we can only vote on it outside of executive session. Yes. No voting can take place in executive session. Is that right? Yes, and there can be discussion. Well, you can vote on a real estate matter inside of executive session. I think that's the only one that you can. So this is very clear, very clear. Let's see. OK. Um, and then Chris had asked about how we, how we cure or fix a violation. So, um, we have to have, if we get a written notice of an alleged violation of the law, um, if it's an inadvertent violation of the law, then we have 14 calendar days. We have to acknowledge it and then we have 14 calendar days to cure it um and that is done by publishing it at our next meeting yeah is that right basically. And then adopting specific measures to prevent future violations, including um, training regarding the open meeting law or in implementation of internal procedures to assist future open meeting law compliance. Okay, quick quick other yeah. question. So if you if somebody recognizes, let, let's say you recognized it, Rachel, mm -hmm. and you wanted to then have the board decide to rectify it, mm -hmm. you couldn't probably in an email, would you have to enter executive this? session to talk with each other about it or would you have to bring it up in a meeting because you probably couldn't email everybody and get everybody's opinion it would have to go on to the agenda so like during the next school board meeting you would have to say um one of the agenda items is that we believe that we violated this and we need to cure it yep okay And the cure to that would be basically to have the email chain published so that the public could could review what we had discussed. Right. Now, when in the, the text that you sent out that you said, I believe it said that we could do adjust agenda items um, through emails and stuff that wouldn't violate the law. So if we were, you know, if someone had a question and wanted to basically have Lane be more prepared and have more information, that would be an okay use of that email chain. And as long as we didn't discuss it, we were just basically preparing 
for the meeting. Yeah, you can send it to everyone, Brian. The problem is the reply all, um, or you could just send it to the board chair, who would then put it on the put it consider it for the agenda. I don't know if you'd necessarily put it on, Laura, or if you would, or if you would talk about it and decide whether to put it on, or the two of you could go back and like the board chair and you could go back and forth on whether it actually needed to be an agenda item or just as long as it's not. Everybody deciding on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are times that in our meetings where someone will send out an email and say, by the way, you need to look at this before we show up at the next meeting because this is on the agenda. Right. That's fine if you're disseminating information in that way, as long as everybody's not writing back to say, oh, that's junk. Why are we even talking about that? Or here's how I feel about that. Right. If you recognize it's on the agenda, you're giving out information and it's just helping people prepare. That's not a problem. Is this, is this helpful? Yes. Don't all, don't all talk at once. I like, I like having the, um, the document too. So I would love to have the, the, the thicker one too that Lane gave you. Yeah, I can send the one that Lane wanna... I'll forward, I'll forward the one that Lane sent to me. Is there anything else we should know? Does anyone want to ask any other questions or discuss anything further? And just so you know, in our policies, it says a board member may recommend or request an item for board discussion by submitting the item to the chair no later than five days before the agenda is being is to be warned. So that's in our policies right now. So if you want it as a board member, the chair doesn't, you can, you can recommend or request an item. I don't know if the chair has the ability to just say, no, I'm not going to do that. Whatever. People have requested things and um, I've responded um, to that person. And then, you know, we've decided to usually add it. Um, so, but you know, then it just turns up on the agenda or in the agenda packet, you know, so you may not have necessarily known that that happened. Right. I just wanted to make sure people knew that that was in there under uh, agenda planning in our policies. So. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, thanks for doing this, Rachel. I know open meeting can be so confusing with the little intricacies of what you can and can't discuss. And yeah, like I told you, I've read that document, like or pieces it's of that document. It's a light over and over, and I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, and thanks, Daniel, for helping us. Oh no problem. I, I, it's it's tricky. We we had problem we had problems on the select board with people that have been on the select board for seven or eight years still hit and reply all to every email and. You just have to keep correcting and correcting until it gets fixed. So that's the biggest one that gets everybody. But scheduling, yeah. scheduling, you can hit reply all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anything substantial. Material you discussions, yeah, you can. Right, right. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate it. Yep. Thanks everybody. Um, if there's no further questions, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. <laughs> All right. See you guys next month. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night.